Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Tuesday, May 4th, and we are going to be considering S7, which is a bill relating to expungement of uh, criminal records. We have been working on this bill, and but then we had gotten some um, testimony in opposition to the bill, uh, specifically from the bankers and then also from the state's attorneys, even though the state's attorneys had supported the bill. Uh, and based on that, um, I decided to take a pause on the bill. And then um, I received a um, letter from the governor's council, um, as well as a memo signed by um, three uh, commissioners, uh, also stating oppositions and concerns with the um, with S7 um, as it was drafted, as it passed the Senate. So I've been working um, with our council, with Bryn Hare and with um, Senator Sears and with the Attorney General's office to try to, uh, to address those concerns because this is very important work. Um, I, I would like to see this work continue. This committee has been working on expansions for a while and we know that it is an important criminal justice means. It's a, um, important for workforce development. And uh, so I would hope that that this draft, which Bryn is about to walk us through, um, will address the needs, um, the concerns that have been expressed. You'll find on our um, committee page, um, memos, various memos, um, correspondence relating to this, as well as the, um, the latest draft, which is 1.4 of S7. So with that, uh, if I could turn it over to Attorney Bryn Hare for a walkthrough of this latest draft. Thank you. Sure thing. Good afternoon, committee. Uh, for the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council here to talk about draft 1.4 of the House Judiciary Amendment to S7. So um, I believe that the committee has that posted to its webpage. So just let me know if you want me to share my screen or if I should just um, proceed without just letting everybody see it on their own device. Yeah, why don't you proceed without? Okay. Yeah. So um, the first change in this draft you can find on page five, and this is in uh, section three, the definition section. So the first um, major change that that this draft makes to the Senate pass version is to amend the definition of qualifying crime. So it changes what <clears throat> crimes are eligible for sealing or expungement under the bill. Um, if you recall, the version that passed the Senate um, made nearly all crimes eligible for sealing or expungement except for a list of crimes and drug trafficking offenses. So this draft uh, narrows that down quite significantly. So instead, um, the draft makes all misdemeanors except for those that are listed crimes, offenses involving sexual exploitation of children, or a second or subsequent um, voyeurism conviction. All other misdemeanor offenses would be eligible for sealing or expungement pursuant to the criteria outlined in the statute. And then if you scroll down to page six, this is when we start um, listing the felonies that are eligible. So um, pursuant to current law, you see on top, the top of page six, um, what will be subdivision B is certain types of burglary offenses. Um, that's existing law. I've added some language there. Um, you'll see it highlighted in yellow um, that cross-references a1D of 7602, and that's because A1D sets out some criteria for what, um, what types of burglary convictions are eligible um, based on the age of the person and also um, whether or not they're carrying a, carrying a weapon. So um, that's just a little technical amendment there. And then if you scroll down to page seven, the um, remaining felonies that are eligible for um, sealing or expungement are listed. And those include offenses relating to possession of regulated substances, offenses relating to the sale, dispensation, or transport of regulated drugs, and qualifying felony property offenses, as was defined in the Senate passed version of the bill. 
And you'll see that definition just a little lower down on the page in subdivision five. And that's gonna look familiar except for the addition of one crime, which is listed um, in yellow highlight on line 18 and 19, the 18 VSA 4223. And that is a prescription fraud and that's in existing law. Um, in fact, I think you'll, it's, it's struck through, I believe on page six, um, because that is under existing law that is currently eligible for sealing or expungement. So I've just dropped it into the definition of qualifying felony property offense as um, that term is defined in the Senate bill. And then that, so those are all of the felony crimes that are eligible um, under this draft of S7. So it limits, limits the felony offenses um, pretty significantly. Um, I'll take a pause there to see if there are questions before I move on. I have a question, Bryn. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to jump ahead of the folks who raised their hands here. They didn't... No, no, it's okay. No, no, no. Bob <clears throat> and then Tom and, and Selena. So on, on page seven, uh, C, D, and E that are highlighted, you're saying these are now eligible for uh, expungement? Yes. So these, these are crimes that um, would be eligible for sealing or expungement as outlined in the next section of the bill. So selling, dispensing, and transportation of, of drugs is still eligible for an expungement? It is not currently. It would be under S7. Okay, thank you. And excuse me, Bryn, these were in the other draft. Uh, yes, absolutely. They're just, um, they're, they're outlined here in highlight because now rather than providing for eligibility for all offenses, except for those um, those few that were that were exempted in the Senate version. Um, now we are specifying specifically what felony offenses are eligible. So I've outlined them here. So there's there's quite a bit of narrowing of eligible felonies. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. For the the Senate passed version provided for um, eligibility for sealing or expungement for all felony offenses except for those drug trafficking offenses and listed offenses. And this version um, sort of flips it and says felonies are, are, the only felonies that are eligible for sealing or expungement are listed in the bill. Right. And again, S7 is passed by the Senate was recommended by the Sentencing Commission. And that, so that's where much of this came from. Yes, the S7 originally and, and last year, I can't remember the bill title, but um, it also passed the Senate last year um, was a bill that was drafted, modeled after the recommendations of the Sentencing Commission. Thank you. So Bob, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Great. Um, Tom, I don't see Selena's hand anymore, and but I do see Ken. So Selena, if I'm, jump in if you. No, one of, my, one of my questions was answered because I, I couldn't remember if uh, um, on page uh, seven, C, D, and E, if they were in the other bill or not. But, um, but with the offenses relating to selling, dispensing, and transporting, is that uh, no matter how much is uh, sold, dispensed, or transported? I mean, is it, is it a, a, say, a a few grams of uh, uh, of cocaine compared to a few pounds, right? It, it it's any amount except for those amounts that would kick it into a um, a trafficking offense. So okay. anything that would qualify for trafficking is not eligible. Okay, good, good. And um, going back to page five, the uh, changing of the qualifying crimes. Uh, for small two, I guess, or double I, whatever you want to call it. Right. Uh, an offense involving, what is that called? The, the two small I's? Uh, I think it's just two. two Roman numeral, it is two. lowercase Roman numeral two. Yep. Okay. <laughs> that was my first guess. But um, so an offense involving sexual exploitation of children. Um, it, so is there any. Any crimes involving uh, 
any kind of, uh, I don't want to say exploitation, but I guess any sexual crimes involving children that are expungible? Or does this exploitation, you, th you think, cover everything? So this carves out those offenses that are in title in that chapter, the sexual exploitation of children chapter. Are you asking if there are any <clears throat> felony offenses that would still be eligible? No, I don't think there's any <clears throat> felony offenses. I, I didn't know if there's just, just something. I, I, th I may be uh, being over cautious, um, but better so, over so, than under, I yeah. guess. <clears throat> so it carves out <clears throat> any offense that is um, involves sexual exploitation of children under that chapter. So that so those those offenses would not be eligible. Right. I was just thinking maybe some lower level stuff, but um, I guess exploitation is a pretty broad. Um, OK, good. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Brian. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Just going, just going back to what Tom started on about the um, and um, about the amounts, and then you said trafficking. I think it would help everybody a lot if we knew, or maybe everybody that has a lot more experience than I do already knows this. But what amounts are there and stuff like stuff like that? Because if it's intent to sell and all that stuff, that's that's uh, pretty serious in my mind. Yeah, does you know what you know what I mean? You want to know the amounts that are that are prohibited, like the yeah, like like I, I guess now is this new? Are these is this new expungement bill basically set up with these? Uh, well, right now with this section with the with the drugs that whatever's legal now is now expungible. Is that how that goes? If I kind of remember language. Um, so, so under existing law, there's possession of regulated substances is uh, an expungible offense. Is that what you mean? Like, well, this is I mean that's a, that's a question, but now we're we're dispensing and transporting, which to to me, I mean, that could be a a, a dealer or a provider or somebody that's that's got a huge amount or did have a huge amount now all of a sudden they're gonna they're gonna get off um well they don't know they have to they have to comp remember they have to complete their satisfy the judgment for their conviction um this this expungement is is separate from the from the penalty that a person has to um complete in accordance with the criminal statute is that are you my my yeah. following yeah. you yeah, we're good. No, we're good. Okay. I'm good for now. Thanks. Shall I? Yeah, yeah I, I, uh, um, Tom. Okay. Thank you. Uh, along the same lines, when I asked that, uh, it certainly uh, satisfied me when it uh, um, when it came to the, the high level, uh, you, you know, uh, tra not transporting. What's the, what's the word they use? Trafficking. Used? Trafficking. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a whole different uh, a whole different game and the trafficking. And and one thing that came to mind uh, uh, when when my son was a patrolman and and if he found somebody uh, you, you know on the street or arrested somebody or was going to for whatever reason. Uh, if they had three grams or less of, of heroin on them, they didn't even arrest them. Uh, you know, in here, it's kind of considered a, a, a huge crime. But uh, the, the people that they found out there with three grams or less, uh, chances are it wasn't even theirs. Uh, you know, it, it, they knew on the street that with three grams or less, people weren't getting uh, arrested and they were actually transporting. You know, it was a very small amount they could safely transport without being uh, arrested again. And so th that's uh, that's my uh, idea of what transporting is uh, um, more than, you know, the uh, large amounts and, and, that, and uh, along with the with the selling and di dispensing too, it's going to be the, you know, smaller amounts that, um, you know, and that's all relative, I guess, depending on, you know, 
um, what the amounts are. But anyway, that's all. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, so I'm just trying to make sure I understand what is being proposed here. Um, so it looks like in addition to retaining the possession uh, in terms of the felony um, offenses that would qualify in this draft. So it, if I'm reading things correctly, it looks like we are um, retaining the possession expungement eligibility for the um, felony possession of regulated substances adding sales, dispensing, or transporting of regulated substances, but as you note, not trafficking, and then expanding um, some of the property offenses that would be eligible. Yep, that's correct. So Selena, when you say adding, are you referring adding from the prior draft or adding from the existing? Uh, no, I mean from existing law. I'm trying to understand because the prior draft like pre created more of a framework for most felonies except with some exceptions. And this we're just, it feels like we're, we're building a little bit on the felony, um, the felony, um, you know, which felonies under current law, it, it is mostly like direct possession and some property related property crime, potentially related property crime. So it seems like I'm just trying to understand, characterize this draft kind of builds on that, the, the framework in existing law. Essentially it just adds a little to those categories in terms of eligible offenses. Is that a fair? I think that's, yeah, that's a good way to characterize it. Um, it, it kind of builds on the existing framework of what is eligible in terms of felony offenses. Right, and, and trying to be very clear as to which felonies are, are eligible because that was a concern that, that there could be a number of felonies that um, that's just unknown what would be eligible. Mm -hmm. So, Okay, great, I just wanted to make sure I was, my my understanding was the correct one. Thank you. Okay, so I'm yeah. gonna keep going. So I'm down in section four now, and this is the expungement section. So if you scroll down to page 10, uh, subdivision two, you'll see some new yellow highlighted language. And this subsection, subdivision two here is the um, language about the, that limits the prosecutor who can stipulate to an early petition to seal or expunge to the um, to the prosecutorial office that prosecuted the offense. And there are two changes here. Um, and the first you see on lines nine and 10, this is really just a technical change. So it, you're, the, so the language is a little bit more clear that for those offenses that are eligible for an early uh, petition to seal or expunge because not all offenses are, um, if that person petitions to seal or expunge prior to uh, the date that the statute sets forth as the eligibility date, only the office that prosecuted the offense can stipulate to the petition. And then there's also some additional new language here on lines 14 through 16 that um, the office that prosecuted the offense can waive that requirement and allow for another prosecutorial office to stipulate to a petition that's filed prior to the date that the offense is eligible according to the statute. Right, and that language, I think we talked about it before, but that that um, was to address if there are clinics and- uh, Correct. And, and so that that um, so that the attorney general's you know, office or others could, could work with the clinics and not be as restrictive as the language that passed the Senate. Uh, Tom. Uh, yeah, what, what we're just discussing, is that is that saying that only the office uh, that prosecuted the offense may stipulate to that petition? Does that mean they're the only off, office that can okay an early sealing or, or? Correct. Okay, I just wanted to make sure, thanks. Sure. 
So I'm going to keep going now and scroll down to page 11. Oh, go ahead, Bob. Okay. Yeah. Um, here, I'm sorry. I just need, Bryn, if, if you could once again for me, we're talking about sealing versus expungement and so on. If we were moving to expunge records, under what criteria would, would we seal records and why would we seal records to begin with versus expunging them? So this, the statute sets out all different parameters for, for you deal with different crimes differently in terms of sealing or expungement. Um, sealed records are records that aren't destroyed. They are placed under seal and they have only a limited um, number of entities that are, that are able to access them. Um, and expunge rec records, as you know, are, are ultimately destroyed except for a special index that retains some limited amount of information about the conviction. Um, so I think that you've heard from witnesses that there, there's, a, there's a really broad um, array of different opinions about sealing versus expungement and different um, stakeholders have different reasons for feeling the way they feel about whether records should be sealed or expunged. Um, so I would hate to speak for them. You have many witnesses on, you could, you could ask that question too, but I'd be glad to answer specifically something, um, a question you have about the difference. Well, my question is, Sealing of records, it, we do we do that because they're not eligible for expungement. So some so S seven sets out um, some crimes are only eligible for, for sealing and not expungement, and also some crimes are eligible first for sealing and then later eligible for expungement. And I think that those are typically the types of offenses that maybe predicate offenses, for example, are first eligible for sealing, and then if a person doesn't commit an additional crime for some period of time then they're eligible for expungement later on. And again, this was, these, are all, these are all recommendations that were taken from the Sentencing Commission's report from 2019. I think that that group of, that group of stakeholders did some thinking about, um, about the policy of when uh, a certain crime should be eligible for sealing and when, it should, when and if it should be eligible for expungement. Thank you. Thank you, Brynn, go ahead. Sure. Um, so I'm gonna scroll down to page 11 and you'll see some language, the subdivision five, the language here is, is both underlined and struck through and that's just to indicate that this was new language from the Senate um, that you would be removing here. And you remember that this is the provision about a person who um, has served a term of probation, uh, that restitution is kind of linked to their pro probation term. And so it provided that the per these individuals who are under these types of probation could um, petition the court to request that uh, basically an adjustment of the waiting period before they could seek an expungement of, or a sealing of their conviction. Um, and so we, we've removed that language in this draft. Um, you did have, I think you did hear quite a bit of testimony about that, about that particular provision. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Let me know if you need a reminder of what, of what that language is. Um, and there's new language to replace it here on lines 15 through 17. And this is um, just sort of a straightforward um, provision that a criminal conviction record of a person who's under the supervision of the Department of Corrections um, is not eligible for sealing or expungement. And you heard some testimony from the Department of Corrections a couple of weeks ago about their concern um, about having people who are under their supervision applying for a sealing or expungement of a, of a record. So then they may not be able to look back to that record. So this language here is intended to address that concern. Okay. I'm just gonna keep going here. <clears throat> so the next change you can see on page uh, 18, I believe, yep, bottom of page 18. Um, so before I talk about that little change, I'm just gonna note that I'm in subsection I, um, and this is the subsection that deals with qualifying felony property offenses and the sale, dispensation, or transport of regulated drugs. So um, if you look at page 18, subdivision three on line 10, 
Um, I've highlighted the words on or after, and that is to note that in the Senate version, um, these types of offenses were eligible for an early petition to seal or expunge with the stipulation of the prosecutor. And we've removed that. So now these types of offenses are not eligible for an early petition to seal or expunge. They can only be sealed or expunged um, on or after the date that the offense is eligible pursuant to the statute. So that would be an eight year waiting period um, from the date the person satisfied the judgment or if they committed a subsequent offense then um, eight years after they completed the sentence for that subsequent offense. Hope that's clear. Um, subsection J, so I'm, now I'm back on page 18, subsection J, you'll see this is the qualifying felony subsection. This was sort of the catch-all provision for all other felonies that weren't listed, listed felonies or drug trafficking felonies that weren't um, articulated earlier in the section. We've just struck all of that language because um, now we're specifically identifying all of the felonies that are eligible. Um, so we've removed that subsection from the bill. Now I'm going to keep going. If you scroll down to page 22, <clears throat> this is um, the section about the Judicial Bureau records. And um, this language is in yellow highlight. You heard from Judge Grierson about this language. This was the language that the judge proposed. Um, I believe that in, that he worked with the DMV on um, these proposals to change um, basically the mechanism for how these uh, Judicial Bureau records would be expunged. And the Senate, the Senate version of this language was really modeled after um, the criminal expungement chapter um, in terms of the procedural, how these expungements would happen. And it didn't make a lot of sense for, for, um, for the Judicial Bureau. So the uh, Judge Grierson came forward with some sort of procedural language for how this will happen. Um, and so that I've replaced the Senate version with that language. And that's um, on the bottom of page 22 and the bottom of page 23 and top of page 24. Um, and then lastly, the last change is on page 24, and this is section eight, the section that um, directed the Sentencing Commission to do further study of sealing and expungement and come back to the legislature with recommendations for how to simplify and automate the process. And the changes here are just that we've um, you've removed the Sentencing Commission from that work and it replaced it with um, the Justice Oversight Committee. So they are tasked, Justice Oversight is tasked with um, proposing legislation on any recommendations it makes with respect to a policy for making all criminal history records, um, except for the Big 12 offenses, eligible for sealing or expungement, um, what entities should have access to sealed records, and whether um, the state should continue to employ this two-track process of sealing and expungement, or if it should um, instead shift to a one track system that provides for either sealing or expungement. And then lastly, um, recommendations on how to implement an automated process or a petitionless process to seal or expunge. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Any questions, committee members? Okay. Not seeing any right now, but well, it's not, clear. it's not exactly a question, but I do think, I mean, I guess I could try to do it for myself, but other members might have the same. Like it would be helpful to really look at current law, what the Senate proposed in this, what this proposed and understand which crimes, um, you know, had particularly in the Senate version and then this proposal, which, which additional crimes would be eligible in each version. I know, I know it's in the Senate proposal, it's more of a framework and less of an inventory of all the crimes at points, but um, 
I guess I'm just trying to understand how much of an expansion this proposal really is on current law. And it's hard to do it without going kind of crime by crime. So maybe the, in a way that's the comparison I'm really looking for. Um, and current law, you're looking for a comparison of current law with this proposal? Yeah, just to understand how much of an expansion it really is, which I can I can do and could just kind of figure that out for myself and you know potentially ask you some questions, Bryn, but I don't know if others are in the same place as me. It's just trying to so I'm happy to put together a list um, of the felony offenses that are currently eligible compared to the felony offenses that would be eligible here. And in addition, I can put together um, a, sort of the opposite list for the misdemeanors, what was not eligible, what is not eligible under current law for misdemeanors and what is not eligible um, under S7, if that's helpful. I would find that so helpful. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I would find that, that helpful also, thank you. Would it be, thank you, please. Yeah, and would it be helpful if Bryn um, did a walkthrough of the bill instead of um, instead of just highlighting highlighted sections um, in 1.4, I wonder if it would be helpful if Bryn did a you know did a high level um, walkthrough and, and could perhaps point out some of the differences from from current law because because we didn't do that. So, but let's take Ken's question first. So the, the other thing that I struggle with uh, remembering is a felony is less of a crime than a misdemeanor. Is that, I got it uh, backwards. Right, okay. so misdemeanors are subject to a, a lesser penalty than felonies. How many levels? Are, how many levels of crimes are there? There's misdemeanors and there's felonies. There's also civil. There's also civil offenses which are not crimes, and usually subject to a lesser penalty. Gotcha. Thank you. So, Brynn, actually, if you could go back and just do a section by section of the bill and uh, and how it changes current law, that would be helpful um, after we hear from Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, Maxine, your suggestion to, to do a high level uh, walkthrough, was that instead of the, the list that, okay. And, no, 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 I think I think the list would still be very helpful. Okay. But yeah, I also I, think maybe, I if, yeah, I think also if, if Bryn does a walkthrough of, of 1.4 as it stands, that some of those questions, some of those um, questions may be answered as well. Right. I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ken, I'm going to assume your hand was, is that from before? Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, am I am I hearing that you want a walkthrough of the of the whole bill again? Please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, starting with section one. This is the definition of listed crime, <clears throat> and the changes that are made to section one, the listed crime definition are um, some technical revisions to the list of crimes to change, uh, to account for some um, changed cross-references and updated terminology. So um, these are essentially technical corrections that were recommended by the Sentencing Commission in their 2019 report. Um, section two of the bill, this is the surcharge language. Um, so this, this section essentially implements a provision from uh, a bill that passed last year that allows surcharges to be waived for judges or waived by judges um, for expungement or sealing proceedings if the petitioner demonstrates an inability to pay. 
So um, that was a, a policy that was passed last year, and this is kind of the technical um, change to the statute to implement that policy change. Section three, these are the definitions um, in the expungement chapter. So um, I, I really went through the qualifying crime uh, changes here in the in in my discussion that we just went through. So I'm not sure I need to focus on that, but I will just um, just draw your attention to the actual definition. It will help to read the definition if you're wondering about the difference between current law and what S7 proposes. Reading this definition of qualifying crime, including the structure language, language will will help. And I will also provide a list to make it easy for reference. Um, but the, the change here um, changes the definition of qualifying crime to any misdemeanor that isn't. So essentially it's saying all misdemeanors except for those that are listed crimes, offenses involving sexual exploitation of a child, second or subsequent conviction for voyeurism. Not, none of those misdemeanors are eligible for sealing or expungement. The remaining misdemeanors are eligible for expungement. Um, so you can see in the struck through language that there are existing, um, for example, under existing law predicate misdemeanors are not eligible for expungement, but um, they would be under S7. Um, and then if you scroll down to page six, we've got um, the, the felony, the list, the felonies that are eligible for sealing or expungements. So we've got the burglary, that specific circumstance burglary is eligible, and that's true under existing law. And then you've got all of those offenses that related to that are related to possession, sale, transport, or dispensation of regulated drugs. And then that um, that whole list of qualifying felony property offenses. Some of the crimes in that list of qualifying felony property offenses are eligible for expungement under existing law. For, um, for example, um, uttering a forged or counterfeited instrument is currently eligible for expungement. Um, but obviously this list expands upon that and provides for many other felony um, property offenses that are eligible for expungement. Um, top of page nine, we've defined subsequent offense. That's a phrase that you use throughout the bill. Um, so that means the conviction of a crime that's, com that's committed by the person um, that arose out of a new incident or occurrence after the person was convicted of the original crime that they're seeking um, expungement or sealing of. And then section four, this is the actual section of law that. Um, that deals with how sealing and expungement um, sort of shakes out for the different types of offenses that are eligible. So if you scroll to, or like I said, we, we already talked about the language on page 10 for, um, for stipulations, so I won't go through that again. Um, and page 11, the removal of that, that section about people who are on probation with a payment of restitution as a condition. I won't go through that again. Um, so bottom of page 11, subsection B. So this is how the bill treats qualifying non-predicate misdemeanors and um, convictions of possession of a controlled substance. So these types of offenses are eligible for expungement five years after the person completed their sentence for the crime or five years after completing the sentence for a subsequent offense, if they committed a subsequent offense, whichever one is later. Um, and it also provides that if the state stipulates to a petition um, to seal or expunge, the court can grant that petition um, before the date that the offense is eligible for sealing or expungement. So I'm gonna scroll down to subsection C now, which is on page 13. Um, and these are qualifying predicate misdemeanor offenses. So these are treated a little bit differently than um, non-predicate misdemeanors. <clears throat> so subsection C provides that qualifying predicate misdemeanors are eligible for sealing 
five years after the sentence completion date or at, after the completion date of the sentence for a subsequent offense, whichever is later. So five years from the original date of sentence completion or five years after um, the completion of a sentence for a, a subsequent offense. And then that sealed record then becomes expungement eligible five years after the sealing order if the person doesn't commit a subsequent offense. And then again, we've got that language that provides that if the state stipulates to a petition um, to seal or expunge at any time, the court can grant that petition without a hearing. So then I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling down. We've just added a subdivision to the DUI offenses section. That's subdivision, subsection G. Um, subdivision added to subsection H for the burglary offenses. Those are tr also treated um, a little bit differently. And then subsection I is the qualifying felony property offenses and the sale, dispensation, or transport of regulated drug offenses. Um, and those are treated a little bit differently. So those are eligible for sealing eight years after um, the completion of the sentence or eight years after the completion of the sentence for a subsequent offense, whichever one is later. And once the offense is sealed, it's expungement eligible eight years after the sealing order if there is no subsequent offense. If there is a subsequent offense, then it becomes expungement eligible eight years after the completion of the sentence for the subsequent offense. And again, this subsection also provides that a court can grant a petition to seal these offenses at any time if the state stipulates to that sealing. Um, and I'm going to amend what I just said, which is that <laughs> it's actually only on or after and not prior to the date the offense is eligible. That's one of the changes that this amendment makes um, to the Senate version. So these types of offenses, the qualifying felony property offenses, sale, dispensation, or transport of regulated drug offenses are only um, eligible for uh, sealing or expungement on or after the date that it's eligible. Um, they're not eligible for an early sealing or expungement, even with a stipulation. <clears throat> so that takes us through section four, which is the big section about how the bill actually deals with um, the expungement or sealing of different types of crimes. And section five, this is the effective sealing statute. And the change here just uh, makes it clear that courts have to make a reasonable effort to notify individuals with a sealed record that they may be eligible to have their sealed record expunged. Um, and it defines that reasonable effort as attempting to contact the person by first class mail, and by telephone. Um, section six, so now I'm on page 20. This is the sealing of records for people 21 and younger statute. So under current law, a person under 21 shall have their juvenile records sealed two years after their final discharge if they weren't convicted of a listed crime and if the court is satisfied with their rehabilitation. And the change here raises that age to 24 and provides that as long as the person wasn't convicted of a listed crime within the um, 10 years prior to the application to seal, then they are, um, and then the other criteria are met, then they are eligible for sealing. Um, so now I'm going to move on to section seven. This is the expungement of the vi uh, violation records, the Judicial Bureau records. So this section makes seven civil offenses eligible for um, this petitionless expungement process two years after they satisfy the judgment for their offense. <clears throat> and the offenses are operating an unregistered vehicle, failing to, to possess registration, failing to possess a license, operating after a suspension, operating without a license, operating without insurance, and operating an uninspected vehicle. And it sets out a process for how that those records are expunged. And then lastly, section eight is that report um, that I just went through, um, which is now really recommended legislation. 
by the Justice Oversight Committee based on their um, work to understand the policy and to and to um, and to improve the policy for sealing and expungement in the state of Vermont. And then lastly, the effective date is July 1st of this year. Thank you, Brené. <laughs> Appreciate you you doing that and sure. hopefully that helped people. And then I think um, a chart or side by side will, will also be very helpful. So again, any questions before uh, I move to our next witness? Uh, Ken. You know, just, just something I, I want to flag, and I guess it shows how old I really am, but US mail and telephones, unless they're cell, cell phones, are so far outdated that how, how, how is due diligence going to be done with that? I mean, I, I would think, if anything else, the word certified mail may be, be in there, but I guess I'm also questioning um, why, you know, an email, I guess that could be changed, certified mail, cell phone. I don't know, that's just something that caught my eye that maybe will be talked about at some point. Thanks. Thank you. So I would like to now um, invite David DeMora, who is a senior policy advisor for the Council of State Governments. And the reason why I've asked um, Mr. DeMora to join us is um, one of the concerns that was expressed by um, the uh, Governor's Council is that expungements and specifically S7 um, undermines the work of, of Justice Reinvestment too. And um, that is very, very, very important work. Um, I don't agree that it does, but, um, but certainly Mr. DeMore is very familiar um, with Justice Reinvestment too, has been advising um, the state for Justice Reinvestment One and, and now two um, for quite a while. So I welcome him to, um, to give his thoughts. Thank you, Representative. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, I suspect that at some point there may have been some type of uh, unintentional miscommunication uh, around that issue. I, I wasn't involved in those meetings, uh, but, but it would not be our perspective that uh, expungement will negatively impact justice reinvestment. I think the specific concern, as I understand it, had to do with potential impact on the use of risk and needs assessment and whether or not it would disallow accurate risk and needs assessment. I'm going to try to give a, uh, a middle answer. Uh, I'm gonna to try to not just give a simple answer, but I'm gonna to try to not get really complicated about it either and take up a lot of your time. The, there, there are a couple of different things. The first one is that that is only one small piece of most risk assessments. And so while you will lose a point, for lack of a better way of putting it, there are other factors that will kick in that will still give you information about that individual. Risk factors and risk assessments are correlated with one another. So just because that disappears, all the factors we know that are correlated with it don't go away. And so you're still going to, you know, you, you might be off by a point. In many of the assessments, the range in each bin is so wide, it will not even move you. You'll, be, you'll still be in the same bin. There's a second issue, which is when time passes, historical information on a risk assessment becomes less relevant. Uh, for example, if somebody, for most crimes, if they are offense-free in the community for a period of five years, they are approaching the same level of risk of recidivism as the citizen who has never <clears throat> previously been arrested. Now, for certain types of offenses, such as sexual offenses and domestic violence offenses, which I'm not even sure uh, considered in your bill, but just as a point of 
information, uh, there you're looking at approximately a 10 to 12 year period before they actually also reach the same level of risk as someone who has never uh, before been convicted of an offense. And so for me to do a, uh, an evaluation on somebody seven years down the road, eight years down the road, and be, be, if you will, be worried that because that expungement happened, I'm not going to be able to accurately know what to do with this individual it, it is not accurate. Um, second issue is that these are risk and need assessments. So you're measuring needs, what you respond to in supervision and what you respond to in programming are the needs of the individual, the needs that relate to, you have a lot of needs, that's what creates the risk. All right, risk is just a static factor that is rolled up from these other things. Uh, criminal history is a static factor, and so you can't do anything about that. But what you are looking at are those other needs or those needs that are in the assessment to make the determination of how you should supervise, what you should be providing in terms of programming. Parenthetically, in the new, uh, many of the new risk tools, they are limiting criminal history to a five-year period because they lose such validity after that period of time. Again, that's with the exception of sex offender risk tools, just to be clear, and domestic violence risk tools. Um, and then last but, but um, not least, the other reason, even in those tools that are keeping them, they're changing the weighting, particularly when you look at things like age at first arrest or history, because to be frank, that, it, that reflects as much the systemic bias in a particular place as it does the individual who is being assessed. So as tools are being developed, as we're getting more data, we're actually making some significant changes in how we think about things like criminal history and, and the, degree to, the degree of weight that we give. If in fact you were, uh, and I'm just gonna be silly here, if in fact you were expunging everybody's records one year after, yes, you would have a problem. But when you're talking about five years, seven years, 10 years, uh, then you're okay. And it's not gonna mess up justice reinvestment too. It's not going to mess up um, risk and needs assessment. I did a very quick scan uh, of states. There are um, uh, 24 states with expungement uh, statutes. 16 states have automatic expungements. All of them have different rules, of course. Um, and looking even at the years, Massachusetts has five years for misdemeanors, 10 years for felony. Maine has seven for felony, three for misdemeanor. Colorado has one, three, and five, and on and on and on. I mention this only because all these states utilize risk and needs assessment. So, so they've also looked at this issue in terms of wanting to understand what the impact was and making sure that they weren't doing something that was impacting community safety. So I'll stop there because I could go down a rabbit hole really easily in these kinds of discussions about uh, risk and needs assessment. And if there's any questions, I'll try to answer. Otherwise, let you move on. Thank you. That was incredibly helpful. <laughs> um, I really, really do appreciate you making um, time to be here today and to clarify that. Uh, questions, comments, uh, Barbara. Hello. Um, so I'm wondering if when you look at our list in this latest draft, um, would you characterize it as, how would you characterize it? Let me not. <laughs> uh, so I've not examined your draft. All I've, I heard Bryn as she was talking. Uh -huh. And what I can say is from what I heard, the connection of the different periods of years to the types of offenses seems yes. to match pretty closely to what the research tells us. But I would ask you not to take that to the bank because I have not laid eyes on the document. And, okay. and so I, I, I'm only responding to what I heard Bryn saying. We've got, but we have multiple studies and we've got studies out of National Institute of Justice that shows mm -hmm. four years, actually even lower, four years for lots of things like most burglaries and, and non-intimate violence. Um, and then we have other studies for five and six years for uh, other types of burglary. And then again, as I said, when we start getting into interpersonal or intimate partner violence, sexual or otherwise, then that, that extends significantly. Right. And how about, I know they don't call them predicate crimes everywhere, but um, the, the use of us um, sealing documents as opposed to expunging. Have you seen that in other states as well? Because 
again, I, you know, wonder, it, especially with predicate crimes where it can sort of, it's not even a true seal in the beginning. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, the short answer is yes, there are some states that do that seal crimes uh, as opposed to expunge. There are some states that do both. Um, and in fact, you can go to, not, not to um, uh, do an advertisement or anything, but you can go to our website. I can send the mm -hmm. link. I love your website. <laughs> uh, and it goes through all 50 states and it looks at all the expungement rules in all 50 states and all the sealing rules uh, and all the states that might, the, there's eight states that do neither. Um, but 42 states do, one, the other, or both, and there are differences between all the states. But we, uh, one of, another of our team members, uh, or one of our other teams, I should say, has spent a tremendous amount of time gathering all of that information and putting it in a place where you can easily get it. And as I said, I will send the link to, or actually I'll put the link in the chat after I'm done so that you can all access that and that will tell you a lot of information. So I've got two other questions. Do we know specifically for um, the states that have been expunging for a while, what, fa what factors it made a difference with? Like how did people whose records got expunged, um, like would, or do you track any of those outcomes in particular in terms of earnings or, I mean, is it just um, committed another crime or not? Or is there more? that's tracked? Um, so the short answer is it depends on the state. And uh, I, mean, I know that there are studies out there that show, for example, increases in employment, increases in relevant or, or wrong word in, uh, in good employment, for lack of a better way of putting it, mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, decreases in housing problems, et cetera. But I don't know of a national study about that. There are individual studies and, and again, we have some team members who spend way more time on those particular areas than I have ever done, uh, who uh, would be able to give you additional information about that. Great, and my, so my last question is, are you aware of states that um, made expungement laws and made the decision to ratchet them back because they had some bad outcomes? I am not. That, that's not to say that it doesn't exist. I, I, I can't swear to that, but, but I don't. I know that there are multiple states that end up tweaking things every year. Sure. Right? <laughs> right. Uh, sometimes, right. It's in our blood, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes stepping backwards a little, sometimes adding another component because the first ones have worked. But I don't know of a, of a, a particular situation. Where, where I've seen more problems, frankly, is at the front end, not the back end. Uh, when you start looking at bail issues, when you start looking at pre-sentence, I've seen way more problems there than I've seen at the back end. Okay, because the only thing I've seen is um, either crime staying the same or dropping where there's been expungement, but I hadn't seen one where crime was increasing. I just wondered I, if you had. I have not seen one either. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Barbara. Any other questions, any members? Well, again, David, thank you. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay. okay. Uh, Judge Gerson, I'm going to move you up because I know you have other commitments. Thank you very much, Madam sure. Chair, and uh, good afternoon to the committee. Yeah. The record, Brian Gerson, uh, Chief Superior Judge, um, offering testimony on S7. I think my comments can be relatively brief. Um, obviously, the the change from the Senate version, the addition or, or um, subtraction, if you will, of offenses eligible for sealing and expungement is really a policy decision uh, for the legislature, not one that, um, that we would um, weigh in on. Um, we have, I believe, I don't know if this committee, but certainly the legislature is um, for testimony from uh, Pat Gable, a court administrator, on the impact of, of expungement uh, on the uh, on the court system, so I, I won't dwell on that either, except to remind you. A um, couple of comments, um, and just interestingly, um, on top of page twenty, um, talking about the reasonable efforts uh, to pick up on 
uh, Representative Goslin's comment. I I don't remember the testimony around that piece. I understand the reason for it, um, but I think he makes a good point. Um, as the committee knows, we have gone to an electronic uh, case management system uh, and electronic filing. The electronic filing doesn't necessarily apply to self-represented litigants, many of which would be involved in sealing and expungement. I, I certainly would not have offered any testimony or any support for the idea that we would telephone someone. I, I have no idea where that came from. And if I missed it in either the Senate or the House before, I apologize, but there is just, there would be no way that we would have court personnel contact someone there's no record of that. There would be no record. It would be a couple of things. One, I don't. The information we would have on on the telephone or mailing address would be dated anyway. My recollection was, and what I would recommend. My recollection was that the time someone um, is having a record sealed, the court would ultimately have to issue an order uh, uh, granting uh, the sealing. Um, but in doing so, I, I recall my testimony being that we would then, uh, that would be the appropriate time as we're sending out the notice of, of sealing to them to remind them that there would, they may be eligible for expungement at some point down the line. So my recommendation would be on uh, line two on page 20 is to say, attempting to notify as opposed to contact, notify the person by electronic means or first class mail at the person's last known address um, and strike the um, need to attempt a contact by telephone. Telephone numbers are not something that we would normally have in our system, or if we did have it, it would be extremely dated. And I would not uh, want to put a staff member in the position of making a phone call and relaying information for which there's no record. So I would ask the committee to consider making that change. Um, the other piece that um, I did request, and I don't think I've had a chance to testify in this committee, is under section seven, which is on page 22. And that it relates strictly to the Judicial Bureau and the records that they maintain. Um, and the reason for the uh, recommended language is to reflect the different system uh, and record keeping in that uh, division as opposed to the other divisions. Uh, keep in mind, these are not criminal offenses, so we're not involved with VCIC. The only uh, entity that we uh, communicate with with respect to a person's motor vehicle record, a record of uh, driving is the Department of Motor Vehicles, and that's why you'll see a reference in that language um, to a data transfer between the uh, Judicial Bureau and Department of Motor Vehicles, which is a regular uh, uh, communication that takes place between those entities. Um, and that's why the language um, calls for that exchange of information from the Judicial Bureau uh, to the Department of Motor Vehicles with the sufficient identifying information. And you'll notice um, that the two years, um, the, the reason for the change is the original language talked about orders issued by the Judicial Bureau. And the order then assumes or that a judge will intervene in this. And the idea behind this change, um, I know the term, um, in the original bill as introduced, use the term automatic. And as I know, the committee has heard me testify before, there really is nothing automatic about this process, but this language will at least help um, to streamline the process that has to be done. It still requires staff involvement, um, but the entry of um, expunged essentially will be uh, the record and it doesn't require a judge's involvement. So at that, when the, the uh, ticket, if you will, is, is paid and we would be notified of that, that's when the two years would start and we can uh, trigger our system uh, so that at the end of two years, um, 
we would then be able to make that entry of expunged, notify the motor, Department of Motor Vehicles, and that would be the end of the process. So that's what this language speaks to. Um, and that really is our recommendation. I think when I testified earlier, I reminded the committee or requested the committee to consider uh, amending what was Act 167, if you remember the marijuana, the expungement of marijuana um, records was supposed to be completed by, I believe, January of uh, 2022, which is six months away, I guess now. Um, but having in mind um, the reduced uh, workforce, reduced work hours uh, since the pandemic um, has had an impact on the uh, on the judicial operations and the fact that we're still operating under the governor's emergency order in AO 49, uh, which has a suspension period in play uh, for the process of expungements. And I believe my earlier testimony was, although we have been processing them, it's not uh, uniform throughout the courts. I would ask the committee to consider extending that by a year. Uh, the, the deadline that's in Act 167 to January of 2023. And I believe that's all I have. I, I am looking forward to the study committee, whether it's in sentencing commission or, or judicial oversight to, to take a look at this process, uh, both the questions raised by Representative Rachelson um, and other, uh, I believe Representative Norris raised the question about sealing and expungement. It's really something that I believe with our case management system, it's a good time to look at this process and if not make it automatic. I think there are ways that we can uh, stream, streamline the process. And the term that we sometimes use um, under sealing and expungement is who has the permission to view a record. Um, and that's really what's key to this whole process for how long and how do they access it. That, that's all I have, Madam Chair, but certainly any questions that anyone has, and I would ask you to consider those uh, changes. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your um, changes, uh, especially regarding telephoning and contacting, um, and also um, working with, with DMV to, uh, to get to yes. Um, and then I, I will look at that, um, the time expansion. Um, I'm not sure if we would do it in here or miscellaneous judiciary, but um, I will, yeah, I'll work with right. Brandon and um, consider it, consider it somewhere. Um, thank you. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Bob. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Representative Norris. Uh, quick question. I don't want to hold you up. I know you have places to be, but in reference to there's been a lot of talk and discussion as to how, how do you unseal a record and so on and so forth. There's been a lot of concern around law enforcement having the ability to do just this. My question is along those lines is the courts are the, the only entity that can approve uh, uh, the unsealing of records? Uh, yes, what, once they're sealed, um, I mean, that order goes out to any entity involved in the sealing process, meaning the court seals its record, they <clears throat> notify the state's attorney, law enforcement agency involved, as well as VCIC that the order is in effect, but obviously, we can only control our own records in that respect, but they are they are notified. So, if the if the uh, uh, the individual accused of the crime uh, and who has applied and, and their orders are expunged and or sealed, is there a waiver process that you're aware of? What the courts would entertain as far as uh, them uh, signing off to allow for uh, the unsealing of these records for, say, employment purposes? The, I, you know, I haven't looked at the, the statute recently, to, but it's very restrictive as to under what circumstances you can uh, request, you have to request to the court to unseal a record. And if I look back at it, Representative Norris, they're only very specific and, and somewhat narrow reasons to uh, look at a, a sealed record. Expunged record, of course, means no one sees it. It's, it never happened. It's, so, so even under our case management system now, no one would have permission to look at an expunge record. So the sealing records, uh, the uh, unsealing of records 
uh, requires uh, request to to the court and to explain the purpose of it. And I don't, off the top of my head, I don't think employment is the reason for that. I can check. Well, let's just let's just say we're doing a background check, Your Honor, and someone's applying for employment, say in law enforcement. Uh, and I know the expungement if, if it took place, it's it never happened, but the sealed records still exist, and, and uh, everyone is mandated, obviously, to uh, take a polygraph test in the state of Vermont. And if the the polygraph starts jumping up and down and reading all over the place here, and then it, it turns out that there may or may not be something in this person's criminal history and, and he or she is willing to uh, come forth for it and, and allow a process to uh, verify for, for their benefit, I might add. That's, that's what I was looking at here, for the, for the benefit for a prospective employer. To, to really answer the question, I, I need to review the, um, the sealing statute to, to determine under what circumstances they could access that record. Um, and I'm just trying to look at it very quickly. Give me a second. You know, the general rule is even with a sealed record, it's the same as an expunged record. Uh, a person making an inquiry regarding a sealed record, the, the response from the court is that no record exists. Um, and let me just one other place. Let me get back to you on that question. Uh, that'd be great. I appreciate it. Uh, no, I will uh, take a look at it because I, it's a it's a question that obviously is it's important. I haven't just reviewed that statute. In, Thank you. Your certainly Honor. for today, but I, I will get back to you, Representative Norris. Thank you. Just looking for any other hands, any members. No. Not, not seeing anybody. Thank you so much, Your Honor. Thank you. Yep. Take care. And thank you for taking me out of line. Thank you. Okay, um, Jill Rickard from the Department of Financial Regulation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jill Rickard. I'm the Director of Policy with the Department of Financial Regulation. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on S7. Um, I want to first just apologize to the committee that our department did not become aware of S7 in a more timely fashion. Uh, but once we did become aware of the bill, we worked quickly to review it, um, identify any potential issues that were related to financial services regulation and ultimately to get comfortable with it. In short, DFR has no objections to the bill at this point. Um, the department supports the intent of the bill to give people second chances once they've paid their debts to society. Um, DFR's interest in the bill is twofold. The first is that we're ultimately a consumer protection organization. Um, involvement in financial services involves access to sensitive financial and other personal, uh, personal information of um, Vermonters. And we wanted to examine and weigh any potential risk of harm to Vermont consumers from DFR's credentialing of companies and individuals to participate in financial services. Um, this includes insurance agents, bank licensees, securities broker dealers, as well as officers and directors of licensed organizations. Um, second, the nature of financial services regulation is that there are both federal and state regulatory regimes and licensee licensees as well as their employees and control persons must often abide by both. Um, we were initially concerned that the bill might stand in conflict with certain federal rules or guidance or the policies and practices of financial institutions regarding the hiring of employees. Um, banks, credit unions, insurance companies, and other organizations take seriously the responsibility to adequately screen potential employees for risk, as does DFR when we're determining to grant credentials to individuals um, to the extent that we're able to do so. 
In the administration's April 22nd letter, DFR stated that it requested additional time to study the bill to ensure Vermonters' personal finances remain well protected. We have now completed our analysis and we're satisfied that there are no serious legal conflicts between the bill and any state or federal financial services laws. Like all expungement laws, however, S7 would marginally increase the possibility that a person with a prior conviction for a crime involving dishonesty or breach of trust um, could later become licensed by DFR um, or work in the financial services industry in Vermont and subsequently reoffend. However, as I said, we're satisfied that the risk of harm to consumers in our state is minimal and that the bill strikes a fair balance. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I do appreciate your testimony. I do appreciate you taking the time um, to review your, your concerns and let us know that, um, that they no longer exist. So I, I really do appreciate it and appreciate you recognizing that, that important balance. So thank you. Uh, Barbara. Hi. Um, you're new to our committee. So I'm just curious about DFR's interest in particular, if it is related to thinking it's going to cost the state money or you, so if you could share like how DFR in particular gets involved that, or when, that would be super helpful. Sure. So th there are, we of course issue um, licenses to certain individuals who participate in financial services, for example, securities broker dealers, um, insurance producers, um, things like that. We also have to um, approve like control officers and directors and other control persons of, for example, captive insurance companies. So in circumstances like that, um, there are certain federal rules and regulations that those persons sure. have to abide by. And we wanted to make sure that we um, are able to license those individuals without running afoul of the um, corresponding federal rules. Right. That makes sense. Because I know there are like, sometimes we have Vermont rules, like a hairdresser can't have a felony and those aren't dependent on a federal rule. So we could rethink our rules, but you have some that or out of our control, it sounds like. That's right. The nature of financial services, particularly banking, is that there are there's a federal regi regime and there's a state regime, and this is also in securities and insurance as well, although less so in insurance. But often individuals who work in those industries have to abide by both regimes, and we sort of have to work to make sure that when we're licensing someone, they're also in compliance with federal rules. So I'm wondering if, um, as our committee works on these issues, if it would make sense for us to put in language that says in certain cases, there's federal restrictions that Vermont doesn't want to violate. So if somebody is expunged, they can't apply to be a captive broker or something but like so that we're not just saying no to somebody who might never choose to go into that field. Um, and yet that would keep us from breaking, you know, the federal guidelines. Um, I, I appreciate that suggestion, but I think at this point we've reviewed all of the relevant financial rules and regulations, and we don't think there's ultimately a conflict between this bill and those. So I don't, right. I, don't know I was just thinking it, as we move forward with expungements in the future, that might be a good thing to think about. But thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Nice to, yeah, nice to see you. Take care. Thank you. you. I'll stay on in case there are questions that come up. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so let's turn to um, Dale Crook from the Department of Corrections, and then we'll take after that we'll take a quick break. So welcome. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, for the record, my name is. And I am muted, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the, for the opportunity, I'll repeat myself. Um, my name is Dale Crook. I am the Director of Field Services for the Vermont Department of Corrections. Um, um, as far as the, the changes to, to the updated language around not allowing individuals under the supervision of the Department of Corrections 
to be uh, eligible for expungement. Uh, we are in support of that, and I, we, we requested that language. We appreciate that that being changed. Um, you know, expungement is a very difficult uh, topic with a lot of different um, opinions and objectives uh, involved with it. And um, while we did hear David Demora speak, I, we do on some levels disagree with, with some of his assertions. Um, for example, we use uh, multiple risk assessments to help determine um, how we evaluate risk. Um, while um, I am not a um, academic like he is with the language and the research, um, what I will indicate is that we use, for example, the um, ORAS, which is the Ohio Risk Assessment Tool, uh, and in the Community Supervision Tool, there are multiple questions um, that expungement would um, basically negate from the assessment. Um, for example, those questions would be um, the most serious arrest under the age of 18, um, the number of prior felony adult convictions, uh, prior sentencing as an adult to a jail or secure correctional facility, received official misconduct while incarcerated as an adult, prior sentencing to community supervision as an adult, and community supervision um, has ever been revoked or technically violated as an adult. Um, as we kind of indicated in my previous testimony last time, um, that is a concern for the department. Um, while we can still operate without that, um, it may have an impact on how we evaluate risk when someone is reoffending and comes back into our systems. Uh, we do agree that, that expungements do offer a lot of benefits. Um, it does offer a lot of benefits for offenders that have been um, through the system and now um, out of our system and had a long period of successful community uh, reintegration, so to speak. Um, but there is a concern. And a lot of our concerns are really around domestic violence and sexual violence. We have additional risk assessments, the static 99 and the domestic violence screening instrument revised, which also rely on prior criminal history as part of its evaluation. Um, these are just the concerns that we're bringing forward to the committee. Um, um, as a concern. Um, while we do appreciate the language changing around individuals under supervision, uh, um, there is still a concern. And, and to, to add to that, a lot of our sentencing and convictions um, in our state are done through plea agreements. And on occasion, uh, and quite often, sometimes the original charge is much different from the charge that um, ends up coming to the Department of Corrections, uh, the, either through plea agreements or through other reasons. Um, behaviors that we may find more concerning are charged as one crime and end up being sentenced and under the supervision for another, for example, domestic violence. Uh, in many situations, the original domestic violence charge and many situations are pled down to a simple assault. Um, and I do believe that would be eligible for expungements. Again, these are just concerns that we're bringing forward to the committee. These are very difficult decisions and I do not envy the, the, com the committee and having to kind of wade through all the information coming forward and making the, making the decisions that you have to make. Um, other than that, if there's any questions, um, but that would be the end of my testimony, unless there's questions. Thank you. Um, committee members, any questions or, um, Bryn, I don't know if you have anything to, um, to add or clarify. Um, so I don't, I don't have anything to add. Um, I, my, nope. <laughs> My understanding is that the department seems to be ex expressing some continued concerns about um, this draft, even with the changes, um, but I don't have anything to add to their testimony. Right. And um, so, Dale, just to make sure I follow, it was domestic violence, and what were the other um, crimes that you were concerned about? The ones we are most concerned with um, are in relation to sex offending crimes and domestic violence, not the ones that are going to be expunged. But in future behaviors, um, our risk assessments that we use for sex offense and violent, uh, domestic violence offenses rely on criminal behavior. 
Um, these are just concerns we are bringing forward. Um, it, it is not a, a showstopper, so to speak, uh, but it is a concern that we would have that we would be dealing with individuals and we, we and we and we could possibly be undervaluating their risk to the community. Now I do understand you heard conflicting information from David Demora, so that probably doesn't make this um, easier to, to 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 move forward with. So. Okay, um, thank you. Um, Barbara, Martin, and Kate. Um, so Dale, is it possible that we are using um, the wrong assessments? And do you know if we're using different assessments than other states? Because it sounds like you're, what, you're, what I'm hearing is you don't think for sex offenders, the assessment shows if there's risk. No, no I, I think the, the risk assessment tools we're using are validated risk assessments. Uh, the, uh, the ORAS, Ohio Risk Assessment uh, System, is, is used throughout the country. Multiple, um, multiple jurisdictions use that. It was created by the University of Cincinnati. It's been validated and done meta-analysis and all those things. Um, I do believe it was um, uh, recently, I believe before the Senate Judiciary, um, a, I can't remember who it was, but a professor out of low mass uh, talked about the biases of our risk assessment sure. and that it wasn't, and it was a pretty good system. So the, the ORAS was a pretty good uh, risk assessment system validated. Um, we have other ones, the static 99, that is also widely used uh, around assessing sex offender risk. Um, the static 99 focuses a lot on static factors that don't change over time. A dynamic factor is something, something that changes. I'm unemployed one day, I'm employed the next. A static is like, I have a history of something. I've been right. to jail before. So the things that can't change. And right. Static 99 relies a lot on static behaviors. So I don't understand your worry about the assessments. So um, I'll do a straightforward system. We, we're not, as concerned with, with old, old behaviors um, for a bad check or something like that. But when someone gets arrested, and I know there is language, I believe the attorney general wrote, that someone has been you know, crime-free for a long period of time, their risk to reoffend is lower than the general population. Where the risk assessment kind of comes into play is if they do get rearrested. So two individuals will have different, would have different assessed risks based one has a criminal history and one does not. And if you expunge that, um, you, you lose that, that information. Now, I can't really tell you how much that risk increases. Um, I just did, I just read off for the ORAS, um, the six, I think there were six questions that were related to um, the community supervision tool, which is a, 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 a uh, the ORS has multiple different tools. One is a community supervision, field supervision, um, and there's 35 factors used and six were related to uh, past criminal behaviors that the expungements could have impacts on. So you're worried if somebody reoffends and their record has been expunged, DOC won't know if they'd be a candidate for probation or community service. It, it could, it, what it would do could have an impact on how we would look at that case. The department is trying to be evidence-based um, and, and we use the information um, that we grab uh, from our assessment tools to determine um, how we address individuals in our system. Do we do programming or not? Do we recommend uh, probation versus, versus incarcerative sentences to our pre-sentence investigation reports? Um, I do believe that um, some of the screening tools that are used um, up front rely on criminal behavior as well. So would, would that impact someone? Past criminal behavior. Correct. No matter how far back, childhood, whatever. The, and this is where, where, where David's expertise chimed in, David DeMora's expertise chimed in. I, I'm not a criminologist with, the, you right, know, right, I don't study right. these as, as my, my job. Um, right. uh, but the, the tools that we use, there's no um, indication where um, 
after a certain period of time, we don't use them as factors in determining someone's risk. Okay, and um, you talked about plea bargaining. Do you think Vermont does more plea bargaining than elsewhere, or do you think that certain types of plea bargaining should be changed so that a domestic violence no. can't be? No, that's, uh, I, I think, I don't, I, I can't tell you how other systems uh, work. I assume plea bargains are, are pretty standard through the, the criminal justice system. Um, it kind of does, you know, you can't have every crime go through a trial because the courts would, would, would shut down. Um, and I, I'm not sure if, if the, the judge is still on, but he may be able to explain. But but plea agreements is, is part of our criminal justice system. It, it, um, uh, it, they can make agreements where behaviors that we may find concerning um, could be convictions that we'd find concerning could, could change. For example, the department supervises sex offenders and domestic violence offenders based on the behaviors in the affidavit mm -hmm. as much as a conviction. So, um, okay. I mean, we're tied, we're tied on some levels to the conviction for, from Act 1 from, from 10 years ago. Uh, but as far as how we, we look at the case, if there's sex offending behavior or intimate partner violence in the affidavit, we would address that offender as either a domestic violence offender or a sex offender, regardless of what the affidavit conviction was. We look at the behaviors in the affidavit. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin, your hand is... Yeah, did you? I, well, I thought I thought I I thought Barbara had covered the issues, but just yeah, just um, I guess a couple of things. I I'm a little concerned that that for purpose of the risk assessment, this is a whole new issue here. I mean, that the, maybe we have to dig into risk assessment sometime, and we talked about this, but it concerns me that that rather than looking at what somebody has been uh, actually pled uh, to or convicted of, that they look at the underlying affidavit and they make their own call of whether it's domestic violence or sexual violence. And that significantly concerns me, actually. Uh, but that's not the issue before us at this time. Uh, but I guess the, 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 there's a question that I, I guess it's as much maybe for David Diamora as, as for uh, Dale as, if there if there are any studies anything out there that we can uh, be provided that talks about uh, how behavior that has happened ten years ago or some period of time in the past uh, what that would reflect on an individual's uh, uh, risks if if there is some document we we definitely have uh, David Demora's uh, testimony and that's great but if there's anything else that we could uh, latch on to that would be helpful as well. I would be happy to send you some of that material. Uh, okay. there, there are studies out there. Uh, I've also talked with the co-creators of the uh, ORAS as well as the Static 99, which is the risk assessment tool. Uh, so there, there's a volume of information out there. I'll, uh, I can't pull it together just this moment, but I will uh, send it to uh, Representative Grad or to Evan and forward that to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kate. Thanks. Um, I guess first, and I apologize if you've already said this. I guess I'm I'm curious if you can explain again what the risk assessments are exactly used for for folks who are on parole or probation. Yeah, uh, the department uses risk assessments to help uh, determine what we how we uh, address the case moving forward. So for example, uh, our case plans that we have for inmates and for people under supervision, um, our case plans use the risk assessments and within the risk assessments, there are domains. Substance abuse is a domain within a risk assessment. And if those, and if those domains score moderate or high, um, we, we would look at addressing those domains, those needs, in our case plan. If you have a high need and substance abuse in our case plans, we would address it by getting an assessment and, and going through treatment, for example. Uh, we also use it to determine if we're going to program someone in our correctional facility or not, if other criteria are met, if they're an illicit offender and they score a moderate or high on our risk assessments, we would put them in our risk reduction programming. 
if they score low, we may, we may not. Um, and again, it also would impact if we're doing uh, pre-sentence investigations for the court, um, uh, risk assessments could impact, do we look to recommend a probated sentence or an incarcerated sentence or a furlough sentence? So the risk to reoffend, trying to be an evidence-based organization, um, the higher the risk the individual is, the more resources the department puts into that case to manage that case, uh, to address those behaviors. I hopefully, hopefully that um, answered your question and you understood that. Yeah, I, I understand it. I guess I, I guess I feel complicated about this idea. I mean, I think we've heard testimony that these risk assessments have some flaws, just period. So that's a little bit concerning to me that sort of one of the foundational arguments for this portion of the bill is to better, is to shore up our risk assessments, which I feel like this committee has talked about wanting to move away from in, in certain ways. So that, that feels a little bit problematic. But in addition, just like if we're talking about using risk assessments and the argument is we, we can't allow people on probation to have to access expungement for past offenses because we need their risk assessments to be more, I don't know if accurate is the word that you that is being used, but like it's part of the testimony we're hearing is that like after a certain period of time for past offenses, a risk of reoffense as it pertains to that past offense is, is really low. It's like it feels like it feels like there's a risk of overly inflating someone's risk if that makes sense. You see risk many times in one sentence, but I don't know if you get what I'm going for. No, no, I understand. And, and uh, it, it is, it is complicated and, and it's not an easy answer. Um, I, I don't, you know, we're just giving our concern as a department um, that we, we, we do believe that, that there could be concerns. Um, I think you kind of hit it right that, that we could lose some of our accuracy um, on our risk assessments. Um, uh, for, for past behaviors. Um, and it's just a concern the department's bringing up. Um, risk assessments are uh, standard tools used in, in, in all correctional systems. I mean, they should be. I mean, that, that, that's what, um, you know, all the evidence indicates that you should be doing val using validated risk, assess risk assessments. And the information from those risk assessments should kind of drive how you apply resources to a case. Yeah, I guess I would be concerned about inflating the, the resources that are, are being used. I guess my other question is, my sense of, when I'm looking at the bill um, on page 11, um, sections 5 through 14 have been stricken out um, and replaced with this new section we're talking about, which would um, prevent someone who's under you know, Department of Corrections from uh, being eligible for sealing or expungement. My understanding is that section 5 through 14, a part of what it was trying to address was this phenomena of people being sort of caught up in probation for prolonged periods of time. And it was trying to um, create a mechanism whereby once that person satisfied that probation or even as they were serving it, um, they could have access to sealing or expungement without having to then wait for the additional five to eight to 10 years after their probation is, is complete. And I guess, and I don't know if this is a question for you or for Bryn, but I guess my concern is that this new language, in addition to other concerns I have about it, to me, I, I don't feel like it adequately sort of addresses that. Like there's no, I don't see any other, I don't see any mechanism within here that would then like, okay, so then does the, if the person satisfies their probation, it, do they then have to wait that length of time under this new language? Is there any mechanism for shortening that window? So I think some of that would, would fall to Brent to explain as far as a policy. The, the request that the department made was that while individuals are still under the care and custody of the, of the commissioner of the Department of Corrections uh, or supervised by the Corrections, that they're not eligible at that time for expungements. 
uh, what we have are situations where um, we, we supervise, uh, excuse me, we supervise individuals, um, not by charges, we supervise the individual. So we can't split out um, individual cases, individual charges. So we'll have our risk assessments and all of our, um, you know, work product, so to speak, is based on the individual and everything that came to us at the time. And when expungements happen while they're under supervision, um, it gets really difficult for us to, to parse that out. Um, and recently we've had a couple of um, situations where uh, serious offenders had, had offenses that were expunged um, that we're very concerned about because um, we would have to look at all of our work product is no longer validated, all of our case staffings, all of our decisions to program, all of our pre-sentence investigations, all of our risk assessments are now um, in some ways invalid because we had um, information that were, is now included from expunged cases. Um, and an expungement means like the, that offense never happened and, and kind of all history has never happened. Uh, and this was after someone has already been currently on supervision. So that was a request from the department and, and the updated language here addresses our concern around that area. Great, thank you. Uh, Brenda, do you wanna add anything? So if, if you could restate your question, that would be helpful to me. Uh, your question that I can answer, that would be helpful. Um, yeah, I'll uh, see if I can do it in fewer words, but um, so I'm looking at page 11, sex, uh, lines 5 through 14 that were stricken out. I was saying that my understanding of that language originally being included was in some ways to address um, the fact that people can get caught up in probation and that it was sort of trying to create a mechanism whereby people could sort of expedite their expungement or sealing process um, who were in one of those situations. And I was, I, I, I was reflecting on the new language and it seems like in the new version, there's sort of like no mechanism for that. And I guess I was just trying to confirm if that, if my assumption is true or if there's any mechanism whereby someone on probation could expedite their sealing or expungement. Right. So if a person isn't, if a person is currently under the supervision, they wouldn't be eligible to um, have an early uh, an, an petition for an early sealing or expungement. Um, but as as you know, from from going through the bill a few times, there are um, people are eligible or otherwise um, may be eligible for an early uh, sealing or expungement, um, depending on the depending on the offense. So they couldn't apply while they were under supervision, but they, as soon as they were not, you're saying they could potentially apply for, for an earlier expungement. Right, depending on, depending on the type of offense that they're seeking to have uh, expunged. Okay, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Bryn. Okay. Any other questions for Dale Crook? Okay. And uh, okay, great. So let's take a ten-minute break, and um, after our break, we will hear from uh, John Campbell. <laughs> 